question about prison culture. Uh, and the things that I really wanted to focus on in this lesson are, what do you believe about prison? Why don't you take maybe a minute, I don't know, maybe half your day, because it's worth it, uh, to think about what are the things that you believe about prison? Uh, do you come into this with any kind of bias about what you might run into in prison? We want to challenge those biases and provide useful information about prison culture. So again, getting away from maybe the television show or whatever exposure, media exposure, other things that perhaps paint prisons in a pretty negative light or in a light that kind of, um, yeah, it's negative. I'm, I'm not even gonna call it anything else. It's, it's pretty negative. Um, so what are those then beliefs about offenders? So some of the more prevalent beliefs that can we want to acknowledge about offenders that are out there in society, and maybe in some of us, are that male offenders are perhaps more violent, that they are more manipulative, that their crime types are different than women in that they are more violent. Um, and so last year at the WICSAP conference did an activity where we said, what are those things that you believe about prisons? And some of the work, some of the words that came out weren't super positive. And so, and so we know that even within this group, there is some bias. There is some prisons are dirty, prisons are crowded, prisons are loud, prisons um, don't ne necessarily, aren't necessarily the most innovative place on earth. And while some of that is true, um, some of it is untrue. We happen to be a very innovative state. So, so challenging those beliefs and coming in as a clean slate is really important to this work and to this partnership. Um, and then beliefs about female offenders. So there is a belief out there that they are incarcerated for less serious crimes. So as I operate in the world, some of the, the things that are said to me about female offenders um, are pretty different than the things that are said to me about male offenders. So just knowing that maybe that bias is in the back of your mind that they couldn't possibly be a pedophile or they didn't hurt children because they're a woman. Um, and not that those crimes necessarily matter in your line of work, but just maybe having that bias in the back of your mind, um, we should acknowledge it. That they're somehow less violent. I say this because they're not always less violent and important both in this class and then in the prison safety class to talk about keeping your guard up, being aware of your surroundings, and just because you're in a women's facility doesn't give you carte blanche to be aloof or not aware of your surroundings at all times. The one thing that we do know is pretty true is that the pathway into the criminal justice system for women is pretty different than men. So often their crimes are driven by a partner. So whether that is me holding drugs for my partner, we get pulled over, he says, hey, I've been to prison four times and you're only gonna do 30 days if you go, so please hold my giant bag of cocaine, and I do, and I end up in prison. That is something that operates most of the time only in that direction. I've heard very few stories in my life of a woman talking a man into taking a charge for her. So we want to acknowledge some of that. And then the, the rates of trauma for women that are coming into the criminal justice system kind of through the roof. We're, Vera Institute uh, is acknowledging about a 96% trauma rate, and that's any kind of trauma in their lifetime of female offenders. And so not that it's not high for men, but it's not that shockingly high. And so some of the statements listed on this slide that I talked about just now are true, either in part or in their entirety. Um, but it's really important that as we approach this work, we're looking at the individual and not bringing these biases into our work. Because there are certainly women that are over the top violent that are in the prison system and there are men who are very peaceful. Um, and vice versa, there are women who are very manipulative and men who are not necessary, who have been manipulated by the staff member that um, they're involved with. And so maybe there's some level of coercion or other thing at play. So just really thinking about those things in these interactions. So then really acknowledging our fears coming into this 
work and saying, you know, what has the media conditioned me? And it's not just in one place. And so I talk about it a lot because it's in the newspaper, it's on the news, it's in any prison show you've ever seen that, like, people are raped every day and they get stabbed and there's these horrible things that happen and that's really not what you're going to encounter every day in prison. Is it an inherently dangerous environment? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, and that's something to be aware of. But will you every day see a stabbing? No, you're not going to see that. Um, so really acknowledging that and then being prepared to face some behaviors that perhaps you've never seen in any other place in the world um, and some emotions that perhaps you've never encountered even in your advocacy work because this is a pretty different population. Um, so again, media depicts prison in a naked light and is very violent. Not always true, but something to keep in the back of your mind. Certainly something I wanted to talk about before you uh, do work with prisons. And then when you consider your beliefs about prisons, what's the image that you see? Um, some of the lists that have come up, that we came up with at the conference was violent, dirty, rape, loud, scary, unpredictable. Um, and all of those things independently and together can be true. Um, but I would argue that they could be true for a motel, that they could be true for a parking lot, that they could be true for Arby's. And wherever you might be could be kind of overtaken by all of these words all at once. So would your situational awareness go up in this if, if Arby's suddenly were overtaken by violence and dirtiness and, well, and loudness and scary? I don't want to say that they're overtaken by rape. I don't want to get sued by Arby's. So excuse me, Arby's, for saying that, but whatever restaurant that is not trademarked, if this stuff were to happen, uh, certainly your situational awareness would go up. Um, in order to be safe, it's important to understand that prisons are a different culture and that each prison is different from the next um, and then remain unbiased. And so what I would say about that is in every prison in Washington State, and then around the country and around the world, there's a unique culture that is dictated by the inmates that live there and by the staff that live there, about their by their beliefs about what incarceration should be. So the general rhetoric for me and what I believe in isn't necessarily what the next prison person believes in, but kind of the overarching belief I would say in the people that I hang out with is that in court there is a judgment and sentence and the Department of Corrections is the sentence portion of that. So the judgment should have fallen off after that hearing. So we are there to ensure that the sentence is carried out and then ensure that during that time they have access to programs and systems that will make them better in releasing so that we can decrease rates of recidivism. So really that's our role. Um, and then we want to talk about, hmm, we'll see. We want to talk about notions about corrections. So what do you believe about the profession of corrections? And I call it a profession because I don't think it gets the credit that it deserves. So incarcerating 900, 1,000, 2,000 people in one building or maybe six buildings, that's pretty hard, right? So it is in and of itself a feat. Um, people who work in corrections are correctional professionals, but what we get often is this pushback and lack of respect for our discipline. And so that looks like, well, why didn't you do it this way? Or why don't you lock up? You'll see it in papers sometimes. Like, well, if they put all the inmates in cells and never let them out, they wouldn't have so much violence. Well, that's nice, but maybe you don't understand the full picture. Um, and I always say, you know, I can read an article about gynecology. It doesn't mean I would go to the doctor and now tell her how to do her job. So really thinking about that as you come in eventually to do advocacy in a prison and saying, why do you do this? Not saying that's really stupid that you do that. And not that I expect any of you to do that, but really just keeping that at the forefront of your thought that there is some kind of science and, and thoughtfulness into the way that we run prisons. And honestly, it's been pretty efficient. People aren't escaping every day and there isn't a high level of violence, especially in Washington state prisons. So the acknowledgement that, hey, something's working in this system and um, 
this is the, the profession of these folks. It will help your relationship with the facility that you're working for if there's a mutual respect and admiration for the role that you carry out. Um, so again, enforcing the sentence, not the judgment. So really having staff come at offenders and saying, it doesn't really matter what your crime of conviction was. We're going to treat you the same. You're here to carry out whatever sentence that is. And on that release date, we will let you out. And hopefully you will be leaving better than we found you. Um, it is a culture of safety. So at the, the bottom line mission is we're going to keep everybody alive today, and we're going to keep everybody inside today um, so that the, both the community and the folks in prison are safe. Um, so that really dumbs down the mission, but if, if I have to say it really in blatant terms, it, it's about safety. So if you're being asked to do something, it's not because somebody um, is on a power trip or whatever else. It is that culture of safety. And so I would compare that to... Um, and this will give you a peek into my mind. So I went to Disney World last year and thinking about maybe, I don't know how many people go to Disney World every day, but it's probably a few million walking through onto the trains all day long. And that is done in a way that you feel safe because it's predictable, because it's reliable, because it uses the same pattern over and over and over. And so then think about somebody somehow curbing that experience, that you're walking up the stairs like you're supposed to be walking upstairs to get on the train to go to the next destination, and somehow some piece of that is broken. Now there's chaos. So all it takes when you're incarcerating that large of a population is one little thing to throw that off. So you're going to hear all over and over and over that safety and security come first. They do. What you'll find in trauma-informed care, in other models that we're using in prisons, is that I need to, and gender responsiveness, that we have that kind of bottom of Maslow's hierarchy that is safety and security. So uh, in order for somebody to be able to learn, specifically somebody who's had some kind of trauma, um, they need to have predictability and reliability. So we're really looking for that and enforcing that, and you're going to hear a lot of that. Um, it's important to acknowledge the difficulty of the work both your own, because the work that you're doing in prisons and with inmates is really probably different than work you've done previously, and then really reflecting on that. These people can't ever come out. They can't process the same way that we all would. They're going to potentially live. If they're a female offender in Washington State, they may live in the, in the place that they were victimized for 20, 25 more years. So really acknowledging that, thinking about that, and that may increase the difficulty emotionally for you to deal with this work. Um, and then staff on both sides. Uh, Well-trained professionals that we know that um, at whatever facility, there's both facility-specific training that goes on and then kind of statewide training. So a lot of that is going to be predictable for you as well, that you can kind of predict what corrections folks are going to say um, and want to talk to you about. So we wanted to talk about the populations that are in prison, who you might encounter, um, some of the groups. And so we're going to do kind of a high-level overview of the groups because I probably talk about this for days. Um, and they didn't want me to, so we're not going to do that. But the, the high-level overview of groups in prison, we first talk about aging offenders. So prison population, as many of you may know, is aging nationwide. And California has had probably a bigger problem with it than other states. But our prison population, the average age now in Washington State, is almost 38 years old which is pretty high. It's getting up there. And what we know is as offenders age, there are more problems, right? So if we're looking at medical care, mental health care, dental care for offenders who may not have always taken great care of those areas of their life anyway, um, the cost goes up. We start to see a more vulnerable population because maybe I can't get around as much as I did before. Maybe I'm in a wheelchair. Um, now, you know, most the facilities are retrofitted for those kind of, um, for chairs and other apparatus that would help you get around. But still, um, 
And then the consideration there is that this is a risk factor for victimization around PREA, and so we're acknowledging that as well. So if I'm older, if I'm sick, is there as much risk? And so that's kind of the conversation that's happening outside of the Department of Corrections and in the media, which is an interesting conversation to follow, is is there an age at which somebody no longer is a threat to the community, and should those people be released if you're an 85-year-old man who is, you know, going to be in a hospital bed until the day you die, should your life without possibility of parole sentence be changed? And so that's certainly not a conversation that I can engage in at my level, um, and probably other than as a citizen, we can't really have that conversation at all. But I think it's, it's worthwhile to talk about should there be special housing for aging offenders and acknowledge that this population is growing in prisons. And so you're going to see more and more aging offenders. And then we talk about mentally ill offenders. And so I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that there's a high level of mental illness in prisons. And so as an advocate serving prisons, you will likely encounter some of that mental illness. Um, and maybe the allegations that you're getting are clearly coming from somebody who um, doesn't have a clear grasp on reality, um, which makes your work really difficult because how do you distinguish between what is even possible and what's not possible? And an example of that is we had an inmate for a couple of years who would say that he was being raped by a ghost through a cuff cord. Well, we want to engage in that dialogue because are they the perfect potential victim? Of course they are, because folks don't necessarily believe them. So we continue to engage in those conversations, but often there's a frustration with those long-term conversations because how, how do you get to what's actually going on and how do you provide a good service? And so knowing that we have really good mental health care, mental health providers in prisons is important. Um, so state prisons are estimated to have 73% female offenders with mental health diagnoses and up to 55% of male offenders. And so in Washington State, you will find um, a large population of mentally ill offenders at Monroe and then at the Washington Correction Center for Women would be kind of your more targeted populations that we're dealing, you know, on an acute level with their mental health issues. Um, of course, at these rates, with those percentages, you're going to find mentally ill offenders interspersed in every population, in every prison, um, and that, of course, impacts culture a little bit. Another group that you're going to hear a lot about um, our security threat groups. And so important to kind of know about their hierarchy because often that, that may have an impact on the way that they're willing to interact with you or whether they're willing to interact with you or reach out for services. Because certainly in talking about um, men who determine their toughness, uh, this is that group. Um, so security threat groups commonly referred to on the streets as gangs. And some of the groups that I'll talk about in this section do exist in the community. Some are much stronger in prisons and some are kind of rooted in prisons. Um, all are active um, right now, both in Washington State and in Washington State prisons to some level. Um, so often grouped by race, but not always. So some of the Hispanic gangs you will find Caucasian members of those gangs, you almost never will find a black member of a Hispanic gang or vice versa, um, but your Caucasian inmates may find their way into some of these gangs. The role of men and women in a gang is pretty different. So men, again, we're going down to kind of the base model masculinity, which is that toughness and ability to fight, make quick money. Um, all pretty supportive of crime. Uh, so women are viewed as subservient in most of these groups and would take a backseat role. So you're not going to see a lot of gang activity in a women's prison um, because they would take their marching orders from the men and they're separated from the men during that incarceration. So the Hispanic gangs, we're looking at the Norteños and Sereños, uh, both from California, both Hispanic gangs and the Latin kings, which are from the East Coast of the United States, and so 
Nertania Sereno fights are pretty common in Washington State prisons. Uh, the African American gangs that we continue to deal with are Crips and Bloods, different sets. And again, this is not a time for me to go into talking about every single gang that ever existed, although there's tons of information on it out there. If you're interested in that, please um, ask, and we can be sure to get you that information. Active Caucasian gangs, there are many Aryan groups that exist. Also, there is a presence of KKK and then Folks Front, which is out of the Portland, Washington State area, uh, which is a, a supremacist group um, who are pretty violent, and then biker gangs, um, often referred to in Washington State as social clubs, uh, biker gangs have the ability to do a lot of damage um, and are often very well organized and even respected in social circles in government. So just being aware that they exist, um, there, you know, have been some pretty pretty awful exchanges with law enforcement and biker gangs in the last month or so. Um, they have shown that they are not afraid to act out pretty um, violently against law enforcement and, uh, and other private citizens. Um, so You'll hear them called STGs. STGs are problematic because their levels of violence are high. They drive violence in prisons. Um, we are doing really good work at the men's facilities at Clone Bay and the penitentiary around gang work and kind of confronting the ideology that allows you to even be in gang in the first place and doing some programming that targets folks who are active in gangs and active in the intensive man management units. Um, they make money most often through criminal enterprise, which extends to time in prison. So these are often the operations that that jeopardize the prison. They're, they're trying to get drugs in. This is one of the reasons that we worry a lot about cell phones, and we'll talk more about that too, that like why cell phones are such a big deal in prison. Um, so again, some gangs primarily active in prison or differently active in prison, uh, some continue on the street. And, Almost every gang that I, I mentioned above um, is active on the street, and just maybe their numbers are really different on the street. Um, then we have sex offenders, and obviously, well, not obviously, but many of you may know that there is some kind of bias amongst inmates about sex offenders, that part of what the media has told you about prisons is true. Um, there are various crimes within this category. Uh, most of the sex offenders incarcerated are not child predators. I think that's something that media wants us to believe about sex offenders. The offender code, so that is it, certainly more prevalent. Um, well, I disagree with that statement. I'm going to take that back. Um, it's equally negative in women's and men's prisons. So in a woman's prison, you figure most of your inmates are mothers. And so a sex offender for that reason is not looked upon very favor favorably, and uh, they would be more vulnerable for that reason. The women offenders are probably less likely to act on that, though. Uh, male sex offenders, there is a lot of bias about that group. They are certainly perceived as weaker and as um, in a very negative light and are vulnerable for that reason to any number of sexual assaults that um, folks feel justified in, in acting out. So, and then we have the LGBTI group. And so dealing, so being able to properly house and acknowledge this group has been really new to the Department of Corrections. So we always knew that we had lesbian offenders in women's prisons, and we always knew that we had gay offenders in men's prisons. We didn't necessarily acknowledge that. We just kind of let it go. Um, a colleague of mine talks about an incident with a male offender who had breast implants walking around the men's yard with no shirt on and not knowing what to do about that because what do you do? And are they putting themselves at risk for victimization? Well, of course they are. But there wasn't really that knowledge about how to properly um, house or deal with or um, be sensitive around um, gender and sexuality. So 
So we're training staff about identification and at intake. So there's there's a huge amount of work that's gone on about how do you identify when you come into a prison and then how would you like to be housed. And not necessarily something we're going to run with, but something that we are going to have long conversations about and would certainly consider housing somebody in whichever place would be best to meet their needs during incarceration. Um, and this is a change in culture that is continually evolving. So down to things like path search, when we're teaching, you know, you need to flip your hand if there's significant breast issue. Um, how do we do that? Um, we're talking to people who have maybe been doing path search for 25 years and flipping their hand on a man feels pretty awkward. Um, so, but for the transgender defender is what will make them feel comfortable and, and that they're in a predictable environment where they're not being sexually, har sexually harassed. So important that we're having these conversations. And again, it is an evolving thing and something that I think important conversation with advocates and with other groups that maybe understand this population better, that ongoing dialogue will just increase efficiency here. So again, here's the reason that you stop and you say hi to an officer when you're in the prison and develop those relationships. So I want to talk a little bit differently about men in prison versus women in prison. And not that they're always so different, but I think we make a lot of assumptions about men in prison. Um, and then how do our thoughts and biases color our interactions with them in your advocacy and then in PREA? And so maybe this isn't, again, you making the, having those biases, maybe it's them coming to the table with a bias, but how do you then overcome that? That they know they're supposed to act a certain way. So the dynamics with men in prison, pretty simple, power, respect, control. That's really the model that, like, I need the power, the control, and without respect, I have nothing. Um, the social construct of masculinity used here often is based on social class. So I think historically we've talked about incarceration and the, the population that's incarcerated in terms of race. And I think the dialogue, and this again is Felice Davis's personal thoughts on this, um, not in any way associated with anybody else, especially Arby's. Um, but, so, it's based on social class. So, what we know is that many of the folks that, that come into prisons are from a certain social class. Not always, of course, there are very wealthy inmates as well. But I, it, it's easier to look at it this way than through the lens of race. Um, and often, that ideology comes with fast money, fast cars, fast women, whatever it takes to accomplish the goal right now. We see this with things like Nike Air that cost $200 and I can barely pay my rent, um, and that, that targets this group, right? Um, as a society, society, we're less likely to have empathy for male offenders. We're less likely to see this group as able to be victimized. Um, and then with regard to prison rape, there's all often a, a societal minimization of, because of their crimes. So if I'm a male sex offender who also is a gang member, and I'm now saying I've been raped, society is going to push back a little bit on that and may say stupid things like, you deserved it, or shouldn't have dropped the soap, or some other inappropriate comment about that, that we all, in any other context, would be so shocked and mortified, and I certainly am, and I hope you are, um, but it's a, it's a continuing and evolving dialogue. And so some of those things, that they're going to experience are the shame of the incident happening, then trying to regrow that respect that perhaps they feel like they lost in that interaction, questioning their sexuality. So maybe this is something that um, in that moment that was the only closeness that they felt in a long time through that physical interaction, and that can be very confusing, and it's certainly dealt with, in my career, uh, male offenders who have been involved in sexual relationships with male staff and then questioned, you know, if that's the first time you've been hugged or kissed or had sex in 10 years. Perhaps there are questions about what is my sexuality and maybe I don't know. And, um, and so that's really confusing. Um, fear as far as 
repercussions from other offenders, retaliation from staff perhaps, retaliation from other offenders. You know, if they've come forward, if this man is sitting at a table talking to you, that means that they have talked to somebody, which means there's information out in the prison that they've said something about an incident, which puts them in jeopardy. So just you really understanding that in order to talk, they're putting themselves kind of in harm's way and that they might be a little bit scared and um, shielded in their interaction with you. Um, they may have a lack of communication about their own needs. So what do they need from you? Maybe they don't know. Maybe this is the first time they've talked to somebody about how they feel ever in their life, you know. Um, folks who are really good with identifying emotions don't often go commit crimes that are based on anger, right? So if I can call up, like, I'm feeling really angry right now and I want to process through that, I'm probably not the kind of person that would punch somebody in the face at a bar. So that's a different kind of person. So knowing that and saying, when you're saying to somebody, what do you need from me? Maybe they don't know. Maybe they've never been asked. Maybe nobody has ever taken the time to say that to them. So being able to work with them on kind of a, take that down a level and say, like, what are the, what do you need right now to feel safe? How do I keep you safe? Having those conversations around what are some strategies. Um, and then the convict code really is, um, I guess the easy way to say that is, the piece that would apply to this is not talking. You don't talk to staff. You definitely don't talk to outside people. And so sitting down with an advocate, um, you know, they might make a joke out of it. They might make a mockery out of the whole system. They might be very resistant to speaking to you because they don't trust that you're not going to speak to DOC staff. Uh, the convict code is certainly a self-protection mechanism and said ask somebody who may have been incarcerated for 15 to 20 years to change that belief overnight. And again, maybe this is sitting on the phone with somebody who's not talking to you for 15 minutes a couple of times so that they trust you. Um, and then really for you, thinking about how do you earn somebody's trust without over-disclosing from yourself. So what does that look like? That I need to earn your trust, but I can't really tell you anything about me. Um, and so I would argue that some of that work that you can do is doing what you say you're going to do, because uh, that may not be something that they've experienced previously. You know, if I say I'm calling at 1020, I call it 1020, not 1025, not 1015. But, like, I'm really good with my word. Uh, we'll earn some of that trust. And so then we talk about women in prison. So there's a whole different set of biases for women. Uh, the social view of women often includes that they're vulnerable, that perhaps their crimes are less violent, and some of that is backed by data, um, but some of it's not. So again, it's an isolated case. Do we have women who have been incredibly violent? Of course we do. We can name cases nationwide, Susan Smith, some other folks, who have perpetrated some pretty serious violence against their own children even. Um, so just being aware of that, and again, I'm not saying that so that you have judgment. I'm saying that because so I have a realistic view of who you're dealing with. Um, there is evidence to suggest that their crimes often involve a male partner. So whether that they got them into the drug game, their gang role is as the subservient person and they were encouraged to commit a crime. However, again, there have been crimes that are independent of men. Certainly there are plenty of those. Um, so again, the Bureau Institute statistic is 96% of female offenders have experienced trauma at some point in their life, which is a pretty shockingly high statistic and lowers their chance of success once they release if they're in some of these really negative relationship patterns. Um, women in prison tend to engage in family grouping at a higher level than men. So in, if we go back to the social construct model, we talk about fictive kin, which is something that happens in a lot of impoverished communities. So if my mom's at work every day because I'm poor and she's working her third job, I might have Uncle Bobby, who lives next door, who's not in fact related, who's been friends with my mom for 20 years. So that happens in men's facilities. But what you see that's different in a woman's facility is you're going to see folks that 
come together and say, like, that's my sister, that's my aunt. They're not, in fact, related. You may hear this in talking and interacting with female offenders that, hey, that's my aunt. Well, are they really? What is your blood relation? And you may find that there isn't any. But I would argue that here and there you'll find that with the men as well. You'll see this at higher rates. The cyclical violence that occurs in women's facilities is a little bit different. Um, the victim becomes the perpetrator and acts that behavior that they have experienced in their lives. And we see pretty alarming rates of domestic violence happening with female offenders. And part of that is just not wanting to do the work. And so they're kind of gaslighting themselves, right? So they're saying, I don't want to do the work and figure out what caused me to be in these relationships in the first place. And now I have some power and control, so I'm going to act out on somebody else. And so we see that. Again, really sad for us to see. We are trying to curb that. And some of what the Washington State Department of Corrections has done is implemented in, through partnership with domestic violence agencies that we're saying, come in and give them the tools that they need to identify good partners and um, engage in healthy relationships. So a lot of that work is happening. I want to make sure that when we're talking about this, I'm not saying, like, these are all our problems, then we're not addressing them. We, we identify the problem and then look to resolve the problem. Uh, women are more likely to share information with advocates, investigators, and other staff um, than male offenders. Um, but it's not always great information. These are the times that you want to be asking questions like, is this, for an investigator, anyway, it would be is this firsthand information. So often, some of it is gossipy. Women often manipulate the system a little bit, and I want to be careful how I use the word manipulate, but may want to live with their girlfriend. So they're going to deliberately throw water on the floor so that they can go to segregation to be with their girlfriend. Men don't generally act out negatively to go to segregation, but it's a pattern that we see in the, men, in the women's facilities a lot. Um, so in that way, uh, kind of manipulating housing assignments and other services that the prison provides. Um, vicarious trauma is experienced, and I know there are a gazillion terms for vicarious trauma. This happens to be my preferred one. Um, but we know that there are high levels of exposure to trauma in prisons for both staff and offenders. And in fact, at dinner parties, people often look at me and say, like, <laughs> I think they're being traumatized by stories that I think are pretty normal. Um, so you're going to see things. You're going to experience things that are pretty uncomfortable and that probably only occur in prisons uh, because of the design of a prison. Uh, you might experience a behavior that you hadn't previously witnessed in your life. Um, there's an impact that happens to stab in offenders from being alert all of the time. So being hypervigilant, as you know, can have an impact long term. Well, this is staff that are trained really to be hyper alert all of the time and really be on. You need to watch your back all the time. Um, and so during your times when you do come into a prison, being alert may have an impact at the end of the day. So being able to process through that. It is a culture of distrust on both sides. So offenders do not necessarily trust staff. Um, I think that gets better, and depending on the prison you're at, might be a really positive relationship most of the time. But again, these are your the people that are housing you for a long term. So will there be times, you know, in your marriage or a relationship where you're cohabitating with somebody that you distrust them? Of course there will. So it's kind of the same thing. It's not that something horrible happened. It's just that over a 20-year relationship, and do we have staff and offenders that have been in the same prison for 20 years, somebody lied at some point, and so now there's this distrust that exists there. Um, and then staff consistently witnessing behaviors that are hard to see and or experience. So one of those behaviors that you might, that we see, uh, would be like the spreading of fecal matter or other things that maybe mentally ill offenders engage in, really hard to see a human being experiencing that kind of um, being in that place, that that seems like an okay thing to do, or throwing urine at a staff. Or, and if you've never experienced that, it's hard to empathize with having
having somebody spit on you or behave that negatively to you. So just really thinking about what correction staff go through and then also what offenders have gone through. Um, so there's been implementation of trauma-informed care in prisons um, that we are working on as a state for both with starting at the women's facilities, but certainly will carry over to men's facilities. It's not a new concept, and we know that, but certainly new in implementation in institutional setting, um, like incarceration, and very much like PREA is changing the culture. Um, and involves a lot of training about the impact of trauma and then operating in a gray area that we didn't used to work in. So it used to be like, I either pass through you or I don't. Now maybe it's talking you through that pass search. Maybe Now maybe it's ensuring that I'm doing that in that reliable way. Um, really listening, taking the time to listen, use your emotional intelligence, empathize with somebody, consider their feelings around what your actions are if you're a staff person, and then giving them good strategies to make good decisions in the future independently. Um, so an example of implementation, again, I use path search a lot because it's a pretty easy example um, that I would assume through some form of media you've seen some kind of path search happen on the movie. It's probably horrible. You've probably also experienced a horrible path search at the airport. But it's consistency and it being done in a professional manner, and I want you to pay attention to your own body the next time you're at an airport, and the confidence of the person administering that path search has a big impact on how much I feel comfortable with the procedure that's happening. And then seeing that they're doing it the same way to me that they did to the previous person makes a big difference to me too. So in kind of me tapping into my own emotional intelligence, I then know that it would impact and innate in very much the same way. So this intake is also an area of focus. How are we asking questions? So an intake process, we're asking about your whole life, and we're doing that in about an hour and a half, two hours sometimes. Um, and that's not the whole intake process, but each of the tools that determine your classification are going to take pretty short amounts of time. And we're going to ask some pretty rough questions about your childhood, about your victimization as a child. Are we asking them in a way that is trauma-informed? Are we asking them in a private setting? Are we asking them potentially triggering questions? And if so, are we acknowledging that and taking a breath? And so for me, in training staff and talking staff through this, it's about, you know, did you say, have you been raped? And they said yes. And I said how many times and just didn't skip a beat. Um, we want to make sure we're not doing that. We aren't doing that as far as I know. Um, but really having those conversations. And again, another area that you can engage in some really remarkable conversation based on your area of expertise with correction staff that that, necess that isn't necessarily the reason that they came to this field. Um, and then we talk about the code of silence. I touched on it before, um, but some of the reasons that it's there uh, is used for safety. Fear of retaliation, so I have to live in this environment and now I've told on you, or snitched would be the term. Um, I now am perhaps labeled as snitch, which is a pretty low form of humanity in prison speak. Um, I have to stay in the environment. It certainly exists for both staff and offenders, although for staff we address that uh, through Garrity, which I'll talk about in your investigations class. And then it's a cultural reality. The, the code of silence just exists, and some of that is self-protective, that I have to live in this environment, and I don't want everybody in my environment to know everything about me all the time. I mean, it's the only thing I have control over today is the amount of information you can have about me. So I'm going to protect that. Um, and then we want to consider other perspectives. So prison culture focuses primarily on safety and security. So being able to put yourself in a staff member's shoe and choose and say, are we keeping everybody safe today? So when I say safety and security, really that means that I'm keeping everybody safe. That's all 1,000, 2,000 people offenders, you being in the facility, I'm keeping you all safe that day, um, it's important to have that acknowledgement that staff are there to maintain order and ensure your safety while inside a facility. Um, 
so important to prepare in that way, so you know what you're walking into, and, and really have those thoughts and discussions before you go in. Um, so that you're not all of a sudden having challenging beliefs once you do walk in. Um, so that's all that I have for 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 the culture. And have a good day. Thank you. Please stand by.